Tully. Thanks for the great welcome. <laughs> uh, just a little bit. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. <laughs> I was born and raised on a family farm in southwest Iowa, a few, <clears throat> a few miles south of Mount Air. And <laughs> Believe me when I say I know what it is to work hard. However, despite living in Ringo County, <clears throat> one of the poorest counties in Iowa, we still had hope for a better future. <clears throat> Unlike my parents, my four siblings and I were all able to go to college because at that time, education was a priority in Iowa and it was affordable. With help from my parents, scholarships, and part-time jobs, I was able to <clears throat> graduate from the University of Dubuque debt-free. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Joe understands the importance of education and the need to make it a priority and also affordable so that the next generation can reach their dreams too without mortgaging their future. He wears his nickname of middle class Joe as a badge of honor. He understands the challenges of the middle class. He knows that given an equal chance without regard to gender, race, sexual orientation or disability, we know how to work hard to achieve our goals. He understands the importance of unions and will support them in every way that he can. I'm a proud mother of Mark, who belongs to IDEW Local 405, and mother-in-law to Tara, a member of the teachers' union through the Davenport Education Association. So, I like unions too. <laughs> He fought side by side with President Obama <clears throat> to pass the Affordable Care Act, expanding health care access for millions of people protect and protecting those with pre existing conditions. That's really close to my heart because one of these was my son, Mark. Due to a pre existing condition, he was uninsurable at any cost. Once ACA was available, he was able to see a physician and start the long process with a hematologist to figure out what it was that was wrong. After months of tests, medications, and then chemotherapy, he is now doing well. Yes. I don't even want to think about what the outcome could have been without access to health care because of the ACA. And I know there are millions of stories similar to his. We need to work together to improve on the ACA and make this basic right available to all. <laughs> Additionally, there's a lot to do to repair our relationships with our allies and restore our reputation around the world. Joe already is well known to and trusted by world leaders and could win this challenge on day one. <clears throat> we know Joe. We know his values. We know his character. We have seen him stand up for what is right and to work to make things better. Joe will lead the fight against the abuse of power that we now see every day and will help us to reach the best days that lie ahead. There are a multitude of reasons why I support Joe not the least of which is quite simply, he's a good man. What a breath of fresh air. Uh, <laughs> With our help, he can restore the soul of our nation and unify America, making it again true, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. With that, I would like to introduce the next President of the United States, Joe Biden! Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you.
It's good to be back in Hawkeye country. I tell you what, man, it's been a while. Hey, <laughs> I don't know, man. If it starts raining, come in and say, start yelling, stop, Joe, stop, all right? Folks, uh, <laughs> well, folks, uh, you know, it's great to be with so many friends uh, in such a great college town. You know, I asked, uh, the bad news is the good news for me, bad news for you. You're going to be seeing a whole heck of a lot of me. Uh, and I promise you, no one's going to work harder to get the support and trust of the Iowa folks than I am this campaign around. 99 counties, here I come. <laughs> folks, uh, the fact of the matter is that there's an awful lot to say, and I'm not going to say it because you're all standing back home. If you keep people standing for more than about 20 minutes, you lose everybody, even the people who support you. And so, folks, uh, look, uh, I want to thank some of the folks that are here. Sue, where, where's Sue, the former Democrat? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Good to see you again. And also, uh, Dutch, uh, a uh, former state senator. She, he's Sue's husband. Uh, I'm known as Jill's husband. I uh, hope you didn't have to work as hard to get to be your husband as I had to work to get Jill to be my my wife. Uh, uh, it's uh, I had to ask five times. Anyway, uh, you all think I'm kidding, don't you? <laughs> Not so. And uh, Senator Zach, are you here? Where's it, Senator? Zach, Zach, it's a busman's holiday for you, man. Hearing another public official having to speak in the same way with, uh, where, 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 where's Kevin? Senator, where are you? You're somewhere here, I'm told. Kev, I'm sorry you had to get out in the rain. I'm not sure I'd go hear another public official speak if I were there. But at any rate, I want to thank you. And I'll, I'm leaving out. I, Bill, uh, I, I, Bill uh, Gerhard, uh, who is the uh, president of the Iowa Building and Construction Trades, who has been with me for my whole career nationwide. Thank you, Bill. You know, when, anyway, I won't go into that right now. But, uh, and uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, thank you for the passport into town. I appreciate it very much. I really do. And, uh, and our, 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 the Johnson County Chair, Chris Taylor. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's one of the uh, most important, uh, difficult jobs here in the world in public policy and politics. But thank you so much. Folks, um, you know, uh, I understand the president been tweeting a lot about me this morning and for a while. <laughs> I wonder why the hell he's doing that. Um, <laughs> yo, yo, whoa, whoa, whoa. Anyway, uh, so I have a man I'm going to be an object of his attention for a while, folks. Uh, folks, uh, <laughs> folks, we're, we all know in our gut, and you really do, this is an election that you all know instinctively that there's more at stake in this election uh, than anyone, at least in my lifetime. But the interesting thing to me is I... I, uh, I've been a professor on college campus the last couple of years, and I have an institute at both the University of Delaware and the University of Pennsylvania. And one of the things I think we should put aside is college students and young people, they fully, totally understand it. They get it. They get it, they know it, and they feel it in their guts as well. And by the way, I might add, parenthetically, don't make any mistake, this is the single most informed, this is the single most engaged, this is the single most best educated generation in American history. And the one thing that's changing from what, what happened uh, not, not, not but three, four years ago, a lot of folks in your generation and the younger generation have said, you know, I don't want to get, I'm, I'm engaged, I volunteer, do all these things, I'm open-minded, but the thing is I don't want to get involved in politics. It's bad. But it's gotten so bad, just like my generation years ago, they've said enough is enough. And you're going to see a significant increase in the number of young people who are engaged because they get it. They get it. And we need them. We need them very bad. And folks, look, uh, the, fact, the fact of the matter is that, uh, you know, our core values, our standing in the world, uh, our very democracy, everything is made America, America is literally at stake. And that's not hyperbole. Limited to four years, this administration has gone down in history as an aberrant moment in time. But eight years, eight years, you'll see some fundamental changes in who we are as a country. I really mean it. In eight years, I think, in the White House, is going to forever and fundamentally change and alter the character of this nation. Fundamentally split our alliances around the world. Make us into a position, take us a position that 
we've never been for a long, long time. And folks, we can't let that happen. And the threat that's posed to this nation, in my view, is unlike any, as I said, I've seen in my lifetime. You know, uh, we saw it most vividly in Charlottesville. Uh, the fact of the matter is, at that time, I wrote about that in Atlantic Magazine. We saw coming out in the open uh, neo-Nazis, white supremacists, uh, carrying torches and swastikas and, and, and singing songs, the same anti-Semitic chants, the same anti-Semitic chants that were used in Germany in the 30s. And, 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 and then what happened, they were met by decent, honorable people who said, who are fighting against the hate, said, enough, enough, well, that's not who we are. And a, and a struggle ensued. And for the first time in my memory, and I'm a, a bit of a student of history, I don't remember any president in modern times or even going back 100 years that have said, well, you know, there were some very fine people in both groups. That ricocheted around the world, not just here at home, not just here at home. And when I said that in my opening as to why I was running, it generated a president to uh, give a new rationale for why he did what he did. Uh, he said that, uh, he said, you know what? He said, uh, the fact of the matter is that that's not what I did. He said, the reason why I said they're good people in both groups, he said, these folks were going out just to try to protect the statute of Robert E. Lee. No, that's what he said. Give me a break, man. No, no, no. I, I, this, this is really, really, really important. Really important. Folks, that rally was advertised as a white supremacist rally from the outside. From the very outset. That's how it was advertised. Show up for that reason. The second thing you saw was these vile, vile chants against American Jewish, well, Jews around the world. How could you not know why people were there? Folks, I said then that we're in a battle for the soul of the nation. And we are. We literally are in a battle for the soul of the nation. And folks, that's why above all, we've got to defeat Donald Trump in 2020. And the stakes are too high. The stakes are too high. Folks, the fact of the matter is that uh, the backbone of America, hardworking middle class people are being crushed. They're in real, real trouble across the country. Middle class people, hardworking Iowans. Let's get something straight from the outset. It wasn't CEOs, Wall Street bankers, and hedge fund managers who built America. You built America. The neighborhoods I come from built America. Ordinary middle class people given a chance have never, ever, 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 ever let their country down. And the fact of the matter is, you know who built the middle class? Unions. Unions. Let me say it out loud. Because the fact of the matter is, all those rights we have, all workers have to make sure that they only have the 40 hour week that you know, all, you just go down the list. They all exist because of the sacrifices labor had made. But what's happened here? So many folks now are worried that this American dream is slipping from the grasp. What's the reason for it? Why do they feel that way? Well, folks, there's lots of reasons we can point to, but one stands out. There used to be a basic bargain in America. The basic bargain was simple. If you contributed to the success of the enterprise you were engaged with, you got to share in the rewards. That was the deal. Democrats and Republicans since the 30s agreed with that. But that deal's been broken. That deal's been broken. The fact of the matter is now, the only people when things go well are the, that are rewarded are the management and the stockholders, as if they're the only people who have a stake in the outcome of success. They're the ones we're constantly told who built the corporation, who made it work. Tell me about the people who process our food. Tell me the people about transport it. Tell me about the people who sell our automobiles. Tell me about the people who are on those assembly lines. Tell me they don't create jobs. They are job creators. It's not just, it's not just the shareholders. And there used to be a corporate culture in America 
where the fact is that if in fact, if in fact the company did well, everyone did well, including their employees, including the folks out there. But folks, it doesn't happen that way anymore. It doesn't happen. And things have changed. You know, as I said, CEOs and the shareholders think they're the only ones that create these jobs. They're, and they think about it, they're called the job creators. They're not bad folks, but they're not the reason why things are working as well as they have. But they're looking at it all wrong in my view. The fact of the matter is my dad used to have a saying, and he said it constantly ever since we moved from Scranton because there was no work to get a job down in Wilmington, actually initially Claymont, Delaware. He said, Joey, a job's about a lot more than a paycheck. It's about your dignity. It's about respect. It's about your place in the community. It's about who you are, being able to look your child in the eye and say, honey, it's going to be okay and mean it and mean it. Well, today, there are millions of Americans across the country who don't feel they can look their child in the eye and say, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. You know, the fact of the matter is that my North Star as your president, if I am elected, is that this time when we rebuild the middle class, Everyone's coming along, regardless of race, gender, ethnicity, religion, who they love, where they live. That's going to be my measure of economic success, not just the growth in the GDP. Folks, at its core, this is all about, in my view, all about not only restoring America's soul, but building back the backbone of the country, giving people back their dignity. And, what, what, and why dignity... Look, by dignity, I mean being able to provide for the security of your family, being able to have a little bit of joy, being able to have a little bit of breathing room, you know, just a little bit of breathing room. You know, the middle class, in my definition of the middle class, is being able to send your kid to a park that you know they're going to come home safely, being able to own your own home and not have to buy and not have to rent, being able to send your kid to a good school locally so that they do well, they can go on beyond high school to trade school or community college or college, being able to take care of your geriatric mom after your dad passes away and hope your children never have to take care of you because you have enough for retirement. That's basic middle class where I come from. And folks, it's not happening. It's not happening. You know, uh, a person's dignity is very difficult to maintain when, in fact, uh, as I said earlier in other parts of Iowa the last couple of days, when you have a sick child, has a pre-existing condition, and you know you can't get insurance because of the pre-existing condition, you can't afford it. Or have a sick child who is in needs or a husband or wife who is in needs of long-term care as they know there's not likely to make it because they're getting palliative care. And, and they come along, the insurance company says, you've outdone your insurance. It has to end. People are facing that until we pass the Affordable Care Act. I couldn't imagine, couldn't imagine watching. We knew my son, Bo, was terminal. We knew there was no real prospect. But we also, I couldn't imagine if about halfway through the last uh, 12 months of his life, they said, no, it's up, insurance is up. What are you gonna do? That's about your dignity. Not only the dignity of the person in trouble, but the dignity of the family member not being able to help. You parents know the single most difficult for a parent is to look at a child with an opportunity or a problem and know there's nothing you can do to help them. So many Americans find themselves in that spot. Education. It's not just because education becomes so expensive and so out of reach for so many people. That's not the reason. That's not the only issue. The issue is the parent as well. Having a look at the kid. How many people are going to have a discussion this summer in about a month here in Iowa, in my home state of Delaware, sitting around the kitchen table and said, somebody's going to be saying, who's, who's going to have to tell her? We just... We don't have the money to send her back. We don't have the money. We can't figure out how to, how, how to get her there. Those discussions are taking place in kitchen tables all over America. I can remember when I was a kid, graduating from high school, I was going to my senior prom, drove down to Newark, Delaware, which is not far from New Newark, Delaware, not far from where I went to school, but about 15 minutes, 20 minutes. 
pulling my old car in and borrowing a car from my dad, a, a new car for the prom. And I walked in and asked the secretary, I said, Mary, where, where's dad? She said, he's out to side, honey. My dad was a very decent, honorable, gentle man. And walking out and seeing him pacing outside the showroom. I said, what's the matter, dad? And he looked up, he said, Joey. He said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I told the story a thousand times because it resonates with so many people. Because so many people are through the same thing today. I said, what's the matter, dad? This is before cell phones. I thought maybe... Maybe something happened to one of my siblings or my mom or something. I said, what's the matter, Dad? He said, I went to the bank today, honey, to see if they'll lend me the money to get you to school, help you get to school. They won't. Joey, I'm so ashamed. That's being stripped of your dignity for a parent to have that feeling. And millions of parents have had that feeling because the cost of education for opportunity people has gotten so out of reach for so many people. And folks, you know, uh, the philosopher Immanuel Kant, excuse me for being sounding so esoteric, but it's the best way to say it, defined dignity this way. He said, dignity is when people should never be treated as a means to an end, but an end in themselves. What's happening today? The corporate culture and this administration has changed a great deal because the focus is on how to use their employees as a means to an end for them to get much better off without really doing much to help the employees. That's what I mean about the bargain. They're not only making it harder for folks to meet their basic needs, they're stripping people of their personal dignity as well. Union members can tell you there's been uh, a war on labor's house for a while. It's been a long time since I sat across the table from the business agent, from, from the, uh, the corporate negotiator, and he looked at you and showed, looked at you like he really respected you, treated you with respect. It's dismissive. There's an article in the time, New York Times today, online, talking about this very issue. Folks, it's not only labor's house has been being crushed, but it's your ability to negotiate for your own individual worth. Do you realize that sometime in your lifetime, 40% of American workers are going to have to sign a non-compete agreement. And a significant number of those workers, a significant number of those workers are hourly workers. I promise you, I sign, I'm going to go to work. It used to be, it's changed slightly now. I, I make sandwiches for Jimmy John's. I sign a non-compete agreement because they don't want me going across town. They've changed it. Going across town to get 20 cents more an hour working at McDonald's or someplace. What's that all about? Nothing other than to suppress wages. Look at what we've done with in terms of overtime. Overtime. It's a guarantee that if you're an hourly worker, if you work overtime, the law, you get paid overtime. Unless you're management. But the reclassification, just last year, more than 4 million hourly workers as management cost these hourly workers $1 billion, $1 $1.2 billion in lost wages. What was that all about? That lost wages now goes back into the pot for the, they either buy back their stock or, in fact, uh, increase wages for the wealthy. Folks, look, there's a lot that's happened. And I think it's really simple, in a sense. It's long past time there's a $15 minimum wage in the United States of America. Long past time. No one should have to work 40 hours a week and still live in poverty by the definition of poverty. They shouldn't have to do that. And folks, you know, the fact of the matter is that uh, I'm going uh, I'm to talk a lot about over this campaign about what my policies are and, and go in great detail. But you're all standing. I'm not going to go into a lot. But let me say a few things today. But as I said, I'll be back. The fundamental issue for me is to fundamentally change the dynamic here. We should be re rewarding work, not wealth. We should be rewarding work, not wealth. Or at least we should be rewarding work as, as much as we do wealth. Folks, the first step is to revise Trump's tax cut. <laughs> Folks, I know all of you, you, you really felt the stimulus in that tax cut, haven't you? 
It really has helped you a great deal, man. I tell you what. And, uh, but I tell you what it did do. It increased the deficit, just that tax cut, by one, excuse me, by almost two trillion dollars. Two trillion dollars. It's the same old deal, folks. While we have one point, and it increased the number of loopholes for the super wealthy. They're not bad folks, by the way. But if someone comes along and says, you're going to give me an extra tax break, you're going to say, no, I'm not going to take it. But here's the deal. We got to step up. These additional tax breaks, they call them tax loopholes. The fact of the matter is, there used to be, just when Reagan was president, there were $800 billion worth of loopholes. Today, there's $1 trillion, $600 billion. No one can possibly justify, at a minimum, $300 billion of that, and I think it's more like $600 billion. It's going, why should you not get help if you're a single parent for child care when, in fact, we're going to give a break, tax break for racehorses or give a tax break for court? I mean, I don't get it. And why are we doing this? We don't have to punish anybody. There's nobody you have to punish. We don't have to, it won't change anybody's standard of living at the top end of the scale. But, folks, the fact of the matter is that we have to change it. And it's going to change because, you know, look, uh, not only did Trump create this uh, top super rate here for people, but uh, the deficit exploded by $2 trillion. And here's what came along. And because I've been through this once before, and I predicted it. It's all designed to now say, you know, we have this great deficit we have to deal with because we can't tolerate another $2 trillion in debt. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to go out there and have to cut your Medicare and your Medicaid. And so, no, I, this is not a joke. They're going to, I promise you, they've already, when we control the Congress, thank God a Abby Finkenauer got elected around here. No, we took over the Congress. But remember, before that, the head of the Budget Committee said he's going to reduce health care and reduce Medicare by over almost a half a trillion dollars to pay, over a little half a trillion dollars to pay for the debt that was created. And what are we doing? The majority leader of the United States Senate, if he stays there, he says that what we're going to have to do, we're going to have to now deal with those things like Medicaid and Social Security. Folks, look, that's what this is all about. And here we go. You know, we should be making it more secure, not cutting those programs right now. And folks, we need to get rid of these capital gains loopholes. I'm not going to go in a lot of detail because it's going on. But here, Warren Buffett made the point. Very cl clearly. Because of the capital gains treatment he's able to take with all the money he makes, and he's a decent guy, he said he pays a lower, and he does, a lower tax rate, a lower tax rate than his secretary. And that's a fact. But by the way, this new tax cut, double the number of billion-dollar corporations that pay zero tax. None. Zero, zero, not a single solitary tax. Period. Federal tax dollars. How, 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 can, how can that be justified when there's so many? We should be giving... Oh, anyway, I don't want to get going. But folks, look. Look. We should be rewarding, as I said, rewarding work, not wealth. And the second most important thing in my view, reason I'm running, we have to finish the job on health care. Folks, when we passed the Affordable Care Act, I told President Obama it was a big deal or something to that effect. Um... Uh, Thank God my mom wasn't around at that. I thought it couldn't hear anything. Anyway, but, but folks, look. And let me stop here for a second and say something about my buddy. You know, uh, President Obama is a man of extraordinary character. No, really is. <laughs> Significant integrity. A truly decent guy. He was president at a time when our kids could look up to the president and say, that's, that, that's a decent, honorable man. And I was proud every single day I stood alongside him, watching him. You measure a person's character about how they, how they respond under pressure. And when he took over as president of the United States, there was enormous pressure. The greatest recession in the history of America is short of a depression. Everything landed on his desk but locust. And I watched... I really watched how he handled it. I watched how he did it. He took responsibility. But folks, 
You know, uh, I was never prouder than the day that the Affordable Care Act passed. And the reason is it was a huge step forward to this country. It made historic progress. 22 million Americans who never had health insurance before had health insurance. Covered, <laughs> covered pre-existing conditions. I go down the line. And so we have to finish the job to make sure health care is a right and not a privilege. It's not a privilege. It's a right every American should have. And I said at the time, it gives, it gives families and individuals a peace of mind. Peace of mind. When my dad, when one come to another and he lost his health insurance years and years ago, I remember my mom saying, dad goes to sleep staring to the ceiling thinking, what happens? What happens if we get really sick? Think of all the Americans you know who we were relieved at least of that concern. But now they're trying to continue to eviscerate the program. And so, folks, I think that we, I believe your health insurance should be covered through, if it's covered through your employer or you're on your own or not at all, you should have a choice to buy into the option of a health care plan like Medicare. Period. You should be able to make that choice yourself. Thirdly, I think we have to invest much more in education. You know, my wife's a, no, I really mean it. My wife is a college professor, a community college professor. She has an expression, she said, Joe, any country that out educates us is going to outcompete us. They're going to outcompete us. Well, folks, we have to get rid of the Trump DeVos uh, education agenda. And the way to do it is get people the skills that they need. There are over 100,000 high-tech jobs in industry that are going unfilled because people can't afford to get the training or don't know where to go to get the training. And I'm not just talking about getting to college. You know, 12 years of education in the 21st century is simply not enough. Can you imagine what, what got us the strength and the movement we had in America was at the beginning of the 20th century, we were the first major country in the world to say we're going to have... 12 years of education at a minimum for everyone, and it's not means tested. Today, you think if we're starting out all over for the 21st century, you think we'd say, well, 12 years is enough. <clears throat> 12 years is enough. We know we wouldn't. So what are we doing, folks? We have to make post-secondary education affordable. We have to significantly increase the number. Look, right now, 65 out of every 100 jobs in America available today require something beyond a college degree. I mean, excuse me, beyond a high school degree. Doesn't require a college degree, but it goes, it may in some places, it goes all the way from trade school to community college to college. 65 out of every 100 jobs. <clears throat> you can't do it anymore. You can't do it anymore without a further education. And so, folks, look, where we are is, it seems to me, that we uh, have to make sure that the economy works for everybody, not just people with college degrees. Not just people with college degrees. Folks, four years of college uh, uh, is, uh, is important if you can get it and if you're going, if you want to go. But folks, those, uh, we have to be able to be, let, let people compete for on-the-job training. We have to let them in on the deal. We have to, get, we have to be working for apprenticeships. We have to be working for trade schools. All of these things are things that are totally within our grasp. And it's totally possible. And it, start, it should start by us renegotiating, by us changing our attitude toward elementary and secondary education. We know, we know we should start education even earlier than we do today. We know that people who, in fact, uh, most states, they've eliminated in school, they've eliminated the idea of shop and, 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 and woodwork and, and automobile. I mean, they, they've eliminated that. That's how people who don't want to go on to college don't want to go, may learn that they can work with their hands and they like it and be trained so they can move into a job when it's available to them. And folks, look, I have an ambitious plan to rebuild this country uh, from cleaner renewable energy, cleaner, safer transportation, a whole range of things that I'm going to be laying out, but you're going to be laying out on the floor if I keep going, uh, if, if I laid it all out. But look, we should invest significantly more. It says this is about the future. It's not just about where we are today. It's about the future, the future. We're in a race to compete with the rest of the world for the future. We should be investing considerably more of our resources in high-tech research. We should be, considerably more of our research money should be going from the government into 
into things like we're on the cusp of curing and ch fundamentally changing everything from Alzheimer's to dealing with cancer to a whole, whole range of things. And why are we not doing it? It's the only bipartisan thing left in America. And no, I really mean it. When the president asked me to do the moonshot on cancer, if you notice at the very end of when, even after Trump won, President Trump won, the Republicans joined me in post-election day to go ahead and increase by almost $8 billion dollars research for NIH for cancer, for cancer research. Folks, first thing this president did when he came along is he called for a cut in NIH by almost $10 billion. And guess what? The Republicans rejected it. So when people tell me there's not things we can work on together, everybody knows we know we should be investing a great deal more in research and development and technology because we are better positioned than any nation in the world to be able to do that. Look, the fact is that for all the troubles we have, I am more optimistic about our prospects as a nation today than I was when I got elected as a 29-year-old kid to the Senate. And I'm not being, uh, I, 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 I'm not kidding. You know, we have to unify this country. It's not just about the other side is not my enemy, it's my opposition. And folks, we got to take it on. We got to take it on in a real way. You know, as I said, there are one trillion six hundred billion dollars in loopholes that can't be justified. And folks, the fact of the matter is, we can do all we need to do without punishing anybody, anybody. And the reason I'm optimistic here is, look at who we are. I've known, I've met virtually every major world leader in my role as vice president and as foreign relations chairman over the last 30 years. And that's not hyperbole, virtually every one. I don't know a single solitary one who would not change places with the problems the President of the United States has versus the problems they have. China is going to eat our lunch? Come on, man. They can't even figure out how to deal with the, 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 the fact that they have this great division between the China Sea and the mountains in the east, I mean in the west. They can't figure out how they're going to deal with the corruption that exists within the system. I mean, I, you know, they're not bad folks, folks, but guess what? They're not a they're, they're not, not, they're competition for us. But here's where we are. We're in a situation where right now we have the, not only the strongest military in the world, we have led not by the example of our power, but by the power of our example. That's why the rest of the world has it referred to us. Not a joke. And when the President of the United States stiffs arms our allies and puts his arms around the Putins of the world and says, I believe them before our intelligence committee, it does us enormous damage in terms of the examples we set. We snatch babies from people's arms in them, you know, trying to cross the border for seeking asylum. The rest of the world looks and says, what's happened? What's going on in America? We're diminishing our ability to influence the world in ways that are of great concern to us. And ladies and gentlemen, we have the most productive workers in the world. American work, no, it's a fact. They're three times as productive as workers in Asia. Don't tell me we can't compete. Don't tell me we're not able to do that. North America is virtually energy independent now, and the United States of America, by the end of 2020s, will, have, will be the single largest producer of energy in the world, not the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, not Russia, the United States of America, including renewable energy. Ladies and gentlemen, the United States has more great research universities like here at the University of Iowa than all, no, it's a fact, than all the rest of the world combined. And every major change, every major life-altering change has come out of a research university. It's been monetized by corporations and companies, and that's good. But the research itself, the changes have been generated by folks in those great research universities. And you know them, you know them, and you own them. You own them. They're every from Los Alamos, every major point you can talk to is a, it's a research university owned by the American people, paid for by the American people. And look, folks, you know, there's not, a, I think there's not, a, I, I, I acknowledge, I'm an American exceptionalist. I truly believe there's not a darn thing we can't do if we set our mind to it. And folks, I don't think there's anything beyond our capacity. The only thing that can tear America apart 
is America. The only thing that can tear America apart is America. But folks, everybody knows who Donald Trump is. Not a joke. Everybody knows who he is. But we got to let them know who we are. We got to let them know who we are. And the way we do that, we got to start by making it clear we choose hope over fear. We choose unity over division. We, we choose truth over lies. And we choose science over fiction. Folks, it's time we pick our heads up. This is the United States of America, and I mean it. There's nothing beyond our capacity. Nothing. So remember who we are. So get up. Let's get up and take it back and make this country what it can be. Thank you. You know, every time I'd walk out of my grandpa's house in Scranton, Pennsylvania, he'd look at me and say, Joey, keep the faith. And my grandmother yelled, no, Joey, spread it. Go spread the faith, guys.